Welcome to the Research Reimagine podcast, brought to you by Nottingham Trent University. I'm your host, Helen Darby Dowman, and I'll be inviting some of NTU's brightest minds to explore how their research is helping us to deepen our understanding of the world. From online addictions to transgender rights and sleep disorders, listen as we discuss some of society's most pressing challenges and uncover some of the ways our research is making a difference. Historically, many of us may think that addiction is related to ingesting a substance, be it alcohol or drugs. However, there are a number of behaviours that can also be classed as potentially addictive. What are these behaviours? How can they become addictive? And what is the difference between having a healthy enthusiasm for something and it becoming an addiction? To coincide with National Addiction Awareness Week, I'm today joined by Distinguished Professor and Chartered Psychologist Mark Griffiths, an expert in behavioural addictions, to talk about addiction and unpack some of these behaviours. So, Mark, thank you very much for joining us virtually for this podcast episode. Um, Many of us and many official definitions may concentrate on addiction being related to the ingestion of something. So, like, for example, drugs or alcohol. Um, But there's a growing movement which views addiction as potential behaviour. Can you talk to me a bit about some of these behaviours that we see with addiction? Yeah, so, I mean, I've spent, you know, 35 years now studying behavioural addiction uh, and, you know, I started off with gambling addiction way back in 1987. Then I moved on to video game addiction at the end of the 1980s. Uh, I was the very first person in the world to publish a paper on Internet addiction back in 1995. Uh, in 1997, published my first paper on exercise addiction, then work addiction in 2001, sex addiction in 2005, and then social media addiction in 2010. So, I mean, as you can see that, I mean, These are all behaviours that don't involve any kind of ingestion of any kind of drug. And for me, gambling has been what I call the breakthrough addiction, because gambling, you know, that's now been accepted as a genuine behavioural addiction by both the American Psychiatric Association and the World Health Organization. And basically, if you accept the basic proposition that gambling in its most excessive forms and most problematic forms can be a genuine addiction, then there's actually no theoretical reason why you can't be addicted to a video game or be addicted to sex or social media or, you know, or anything else, to be honest. And I, you know, I often get criticised as watering down the concept of addiction by applying it to things that don't involve drugs. But I've got very strict you know, clinical criteria for how I define an addiction. And by my criteria, very few people would actually be genuinely addicted to a video game or, or social media or gambling uh, because I'm using you know, things that are being taken from if you like the psychoactive substance literature i've applied them to to behavioral addictions but of course you know there are mass you know there are big differences between all addictions you know what i do i look for the commonalities rather than the, the than the dissimilarities but you know for 35 years now you know i've now built up a you know a, a large body of work which does show that a small but significant minority minority of people do become addicted to things like gambling or video games so what is the difference then between just being really enthusiastic about something and being addicted to something? OK, I mean, the easiest way I can explain it is I, I've got uh, what I call my, my addiction components model. OK, and basically this, this, you know, my model proposes that any behaviour that fulfills six particular um, type, you know, types of activity, I would class that behaviour as, you know, a genuine addiction. So if I let's say I'll take something like social media, which is very you know, social media addiction is a a very controversial area. I mean, a lot of people will say, you know, you can't possibly become addicted to to social media. By using my model, okay, if I take you through social media and I apply it to to what I call my addiction components model, uh, probably after I've explained it, there would actually be very few people that are genuinely addicted. But I do think there are people out there that that fulfil my criteria. So the first one is what we call salience. And this basically means that this is the most important thing in this person's life. You know, so if we apply it to social media is that social, you know, your social media use is the single most important thing that you do. And you probably do it to the neglect of everything else. You are totally preoccupied with it. The second thing is what we call mood modification is that I would use social media either as a way of getting buzzed up, high, aroused, excited or to do the exact opposite, to tranquilize, to escape, to numb, to distress, to relax. The third component is what we call tolerance. And this is the idea of, you know, people needing more, you know, basically building up the number of hours they spend on social media every single day. You know, you've started off 
when you first start 30 minutes a day. Six months later, you might be doing a couple of hours a day. A year later, you might be spending eight, nine, 10 hours a day on social media. Then what we've got, the fourth component is what we call withdrawal symptoms. So if, if I'm genuinely addicted to social media and I'm unable to, to log on to Instagram or to Facebook or whatever you like to do, is that on a physical level, you will experience things like nausea, stomach cramps, um, you know, palpitations, sweating. On a psychological level, you'll feel really moody or irritable or frustrated that you can't actually engage in your social media. And then we've got the fifth component, which for, which for me is the, the most important one. It's what we call conflict. And what we're saying here is we apply it to social media use is that your social media use is so conflicting in your life. It's compromising your personal relationships with your loved ones, your family, your friends, your work colleagues. You're also it has conflict with your um, occupation or education, depending on, on what age you are. Also, you have what I call intrapsychic conflict, conflict within yourself. You know you're spending too much time on social media. You know that you probably should try and cut down or stop, but you feel unable to do so and you experience a subjective loss of control. And then finally, we've got relapse. And so this is the idea, you know, if you, if you do want to try and cut down or even stop your social media use, if you've, if you've stopped for two days, two weeks, two months, or even two years, is that when you start going back on social media, you go straight back into the addictive cycles you're in before. Now, taken as a whole, if you take those six components I've just said, salience, mood modification, tolerance, withdrawal, mood modification and conflict. My argument is if anybody fulfills all of those six components, I would operationally define them as genuinely addicted to that activity. But the good news is very few activities you would fulfill every single one of those those criteria, which means very few people are addicted to things like social media or video games. However, People say to me, well, you know, what, what happens if they fulfill three or four of those? And my answer would be, well, that would probably indicate what I call problematic use rather than addictive use. So, for instance, you know, I think a lot of parents, you know, they worry about the, the amount of time their children spend, children spends on social media or video games. You know, and this might have a, a knock on effect in terms of not doing the homework or not engaging in enough physical activity. Well, that is not addiction. That is, you know, that might be something that's problematic because it's having a negative effect on your education. It's having a negative effect on your physical education. But that in and of itself is not addictive behavior. And obviously, if you're a parent, you know, you, you know, you as a parent and I, you know, I've, I've got, you know, three, um, three of my children have grown up in this, this digital age. You know, they're what I call screen ages. You know, they have never known a world without, you know, interactive television, without a smartphone, without the Internet. Um, you know, they, you know, they're they're living a very different to life of how I, you know, how I was when I was growing up as a as a child and, and a teenager. But as a parent, is that you know you do have to kind of moderate, you know, particularly your children's technological use of, of various screen-based devices because these things, even if they're not genuine addictions, they can certainly have a, a negative impact in terms of other important things in their life. And I say it's not just education or physical education that can also include things like peer development, interacting, you know, developing those social skills with friends and doing things that, you know, you know, you want your children to do it around the house in terms of chores, et cetera, to earn things like to earn things like pocket money. So, you know, for me, all behaviours are on this continuum from obviously totally non problematic, doing things quite irregularly and occasionally through to something with it maybe become more habitual um, without necessarily having problems through to the more pathological and addictive end of the spectrum, which is obviously, you know, a mind, you know, a very small minority of people would end up in whatever behaviour is that I, you know, classed as addiction. But obviously, for those that you know, I would define as addicts, this is something that's a real problem in their lives. And so, if you're susceptible, like in terms of you've already hitting, like say, three, four of those six components. Is it likely that that will develop or is it actually you're sort of saying you have to have six from the beginning? Like, how does it work? Does do people slip or is it generally you're kind of it's problematic and you won't get to that addiction stage? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I have, you know, you know, as a former professor of gambling studies, what we call it's horses for courses. There are individual differences in people. And when we talk about predispositions and susceptibilities and vulnerabilities, we have to take into into account there are what we call different pathways into addiction. There are different etiologies. 
you know, it, you know, if I just take this, take a step, step back a minute before I answer your question, you know, one of the things that, you know, is important for me is, you know, what are the influences that, if you like, determine how somebody acquires, develops and maintains a particular addiction? Now, probably the most important things are what we call those individual factors. And so these are things like biological or genetic predispositions. These are things like personality traits. These are things like your attitudes, your expectations, your beliefs about certain behaviours and things that, that you do. So what I'm talking about there is everything that's internal to the person. However, they are not the only factors that influence addiction. And I, you know, I've spent actually most of my career actually looking at things outside of the person, particularly what we call the situational and structural characteristics. So things like if we take the example of gambling, you know, a situational characteristic in, in gambling might be things like uh, advertising or marketing of a gambling product. It, it's things like where you where you put your gambling venues, you know, so and also, it, it, you know, even things like what we call a, a micro situational characteristics. When I walk into a casino, what are you know, what are things in that casino environment that might actually end up with me spending more? So, for instance, you know, if I place a cash machine right next to the roulette table, that is going to be something that makes it easier for me just to go and get money and to, to carry on gambling. If in that environment they give me free alcohol while I'm playing, that might also be another situational factor that gets me to, to, to gamble more. You know, so there are there are what we call these little design features that you will find in in all types of gambling venue that might make people um, continue to gamble. And for me, you know, what I've spent a lot of my career is looking what we call these structural characteristics. You know, what are designed into products? You know, what is designed into social media, into video games, into gambling that gets you to to do these activities again and again and again. So if I take the example of gambling. The, the single most important structural characteristic in gambling that has an influence on addiction is what we call event frequency. You know, you cannot become addicted to, for instance, a biweekly national lottery. You can spend too much money on it, but by, you know, by my criteria, it's impossible to become addicted to something where you only get the result of your gamble twice every week. You know, if you only get the, you know, if you only find out whether you've won the lottery on a Wednesday night and on a Saturday night, you know, Addictions are all about constant rewards. You cannot become addicted to something unless you're constantly being rewarded. Now, as say a biweekly national lottery, you only find out the result of your reward twice a week. But something like a slot machine, you can gamble 12 times a minute on a slot machine. On an online slot machine, you can gamble 30 or 40 times a minute on some online slot machines. So, you know, what the, the, the kind of general rule of thumb is that the, you know, the, the more more frequent the events occurring, the more likely there is to be an association with addiction and problematic behaviour. So what you might be saying, or sorry, what you might think I'm saying is, well, Mark, you're saying is that lotteries are, are non-addictive and that slot machines are addictive. Well, in fact, that's not what I'm saying, because I'm saying it's to do with the structural characteristics, because I could create you know, the safest slot machine in the world and you would never become addicted to it. And how would I do that? When you come to play my slot machine, I'm only going to let you press the button you know, or pull the lever. I'll let you do it once on a Wednesday night. I'll let you do it again once on a Saturday night. And I can guarantee you, you'll never become addicted to that slot machine because you can only play it twice a week. I could also create you the single most addictive lottery product. And by instead of having a draw once on a Wednesday night and once on a, on a Saturday night, I could actually have the draw every minute. You know, now you might say, oh, you're being facetious there. Well, in fact, there is a game called Kino. It's not here available here in the UK, but it does exist in other countries and other jurisdictions where there are automated lottery draws every few minutes. And, you know, people do become addicted to those type of lotteries because of this very high event frequency. Obviously, the slot machine I just talked to you about is hypothetical. And in fact, I would go out of business very, very quickly because nobody wants to play a slot machine that you can only play. You know, you can only press the button twice a week. But that just shows you in a very simple, simple way that something like event frequency has a massive or can have a massive impact uh, on addiction. But of course, it's all to do with the interaction between these your individual characteristics, these structural characteristics and the situational characteristics. You know, and going back to, you know, what was your original question about kind of vulnerabilities and people's pathways and what happens? You know, it will be different for different people. And the good news for lots of addictions 
is that you know we we tend to know that addictions tend to be um, more predisposed when you are younger. You know, it's it's you know we as human beings, uh, particularly adolescents and emerging adults, they're they're hardwired to enjoy really risky but rewarding activities, whether it's sex, whether it's gambling, whether it's smoking, taking drugs. These all seem better when you are younger. You know, the older you get, what tends to happen is addictions tend to mature out. That's not to say that adults don't experience addictions. Yes, they do. And, you know, obviously we, we can look at alcohol addiction. We can look at heroin addiction. We can look at gambling addiction where, you know, we do get people in their 30s, 40s and 50s who have you know massive problems with, with these behaviours. But for most people, the good news is, is that addictions do tend to, to mature out. Uh, we also know with addictions is that people, you know, they, they, you know, they can go from being, you know, being a chronic gambler to being someone that gambles less for a while and go back to, to chronic gambling. It's something that people can drift in and out of depending on the circumstances in their lives. We know that most addictions, people, uh, it's what I would call a secondary addiction. Most people are using addictions to cope with other underlying problems in their life, whether it's a physical disability or a, a dysfunctional relationship or the fact that you, you know, you're not enjoying work or whatever. Whatever those reasons are, People smoke, they drink, they gamble, they play video games as a way, if you like, to kind of self-medicate. They use it to cope with other underlying problems. And of course, those problems can be cyclical, you know. So, you know, I, I can think of particular, you know, particular individuals I know, for instance, who when they're not in a relationship, you know, they, they've broken up, is that they resort to gambling as a way to, 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 to fill the void in their life. But when they meet somebody else new, the gambling just just dissipates and you know you get this cycle of people only having problems when certain things in their life happen we know that major life events like bereavement or losing your job these can often be catalysts for people engaging in addictive behaviors some of these can be very for a very short time until that problem is solved for others it will be much longer however there are also what i call primary addictions and i think this is a much smaller category where people are, are you know they're genuinely addicted you know they're they're not engaging in excessive sex or excessive drinking or excessive gambling because they're trying to escape or cope with something else in their life they're doing it because they actually really like it at least that's what they started off doing and in fact that you know these people are far more resistant to treatment uh, you know for, for for you know for the vast majority of people i think that addictions are uh, you know, the, if you like, the addiction is symptomatic of other underlying problems, so they're actually easier to treat, whereas, you know, those people have what I would call a primary addiction. They're far more resistant to treatment uh, because they, you know, they fundamentally enjoy something about the activity that they're engaged in. So what, what are the issues then with behavioural addictions? Like, how do they affect us in terms of our well-being and, and health? Well, you know, most addictions, whether, you know, I, I think when people think of drug addictions and they think of, you know, you're ingesting something into your body, therefore there are going to be health and psychological effects as a result of doing that. We get those we, we, we get those with behavioural addictions as well. And in fact, you know, if I take something like gambling, which is the, the activity I've spent most time researching, is that, you know, people, uh, you know, if you become addicted to gambling, then that's usually going to cause you financial problems because it causes financial problems and goes beyond your disposable income, that can often cause criminal problems as well, because you often have to resort to you know, criminal behavior to, to fund your addiction. Now that on a, you know, on a psychological and, and behavioral level can have, have different effects for different people. But usually when you are yeah, in yeah, a behavioral addiction, is it becomes something that's all encompassing and actually leads to huge stresses in your life and things like stress can actually lead to lots of physical problems in your body. So even though these might be psychosomatic, um, you know, what I'm saying is that psychological problems do end up having you know, major health problems for those who are addicted. You know, if you are undergoing massive stress, that's gonna make you more predisposed to things like having heart attacks, you know, having you know, various diseases as a result of the stress that's caused by the addiction that you have. I mean, anything that takes a huge amount of time away from relationships, away, away from your occupation or education is going to have deleterious effects on, on people's lives. Uh, and these can result in psychological problems and they can result in health problems. So even though I think most people, you know, they know that, you know, constant heroin abuse or constant uh, alcohol abuse 
will lead to, to health problems. That is also the case for those who are gamblers, video game players, social media users who, you know, genuinely become addicted. As I say, the good news is very few people would do that. But for those people that, that do have what I would consider genuine addictive behaviours, there will be massive knock on behavioural, psychological and health problems as a result of, of the addiction you're in. Is there such a thing as an um, addictive personality? So I know we hear that, you know, it goes back to that question a bit about, you know, do we overuse the word addiction? But is, is there such a thing as addictive personalities? OK, for me, I've actually, I mean, I've actually written a paper called The Myth of Addictive Personality. For me, it is a complete myth. And what I mean by that is that I'm, I, there is no evidence that there is a, if you like, a, a trait that is predictive of addiction and addiction alone. Now, that does not mean that personality is not important in the development of addictive behaviours, because it is. We know, for instance, that uh, people who are, you know, we, there's a trait called neuroticism. You know, people who are highly neurotic, very anxious, frustrated about things. Uh, you know, we know that many addictive behaviours is uh, associated with neuroticism. We also know there's something called conscientiousness, that the more conscientious you are, the less likely you are to be, you know, to have addictive behaviour. Now, the problem with this, even if we find that 100% of all addicts are neurotic, I can show you examples of people who are neurotic, but they're not addicted to anything. And, you know, what I'm saying there is that, yes, there are personality traits that are associated with addiction, but none of these are predictive of addiction. Mm -hmm. Now, people might say I'm being very hard line there. And yes, I am. And, you know, one of the, the, the you know, people always say to me, well, you know, uh, you know, well, I can tell you now, if I walk into a room of Gamblers Anonymous, what do I find? It's a group of chain smoking, coffee drinking individuals. What we often find is that, addic you know, if you've given up one addiction, and particularly if it's a, what I call it, you know, it's a behaviour addiction that's taken up a lot of time. If you give that behaviour up, you are left with this big empty space, what I call the void. And often the only way you can fill the void and to get experiences that, you know, that, you know, that you used to get from gambling or video game playing is actually to do another activity that gives you the same kinds of feelings, the same kinds of rewards, which is why, you know, in, you know I, I call that reciprocity in the sense that you give up one addiction and you go into another because it, it gives you the same kind of feelings, the same kind of rewards. But that is not addictive personality. OK, what we're saying there is that, you know, when there's this big empty hole in your life, it's not surprising when people fill it with other, you know, other potentially addictive behaviours that, you know, and I've had addicts themselves. They they use it as what I call a functional attribution. It actually helps them to deal with and understand their behaviour. You know, I've got no problems if an addict says, you know, I've got an addictive personality and that's why I do this thing. And that's why I've gone from this addiction to that addiction to because it helps them come to terms. It gives, if you like, gives them an excuse for their behavior. But, you know, for me, on if you take from the therapist side or, you know, wanting to intervene and help, if you actually say that addictive personality exists, what you're actually saying is that these people can never be treated. You know, and that's not the case. We, You know, the good news is, is that, you know, for those people where the behavior doesn't mature out or spontaneously remit, is that these people can be treated, okay? And, you know, it, obviously people have to take responsibility for their own behaviour as well as, you know, take, you know, having help from the outside and having laws and whatever to, to, to help all, all these things. But if you, you know, if you're somebody that just says, I've got an addictive personality, um, you're actually saying, I've got no responsibility for this behaviour whatsoever. And to be honest, in the treatment of all addictions, you know, whether it's smoking, whether it's, heroin whether it's gambling whether it's video game play taking responsibility for your be yeah it's, it's an important part of the treatment process you know i'm not a practitioner so i can't you know say it as a you know somebody that treats people day in day out i don't yeah i'm a psychologist but all psychologists will tell you is that with any behavior you do you know particularly where it's problematic behavior if you don't take responsibility for your own behavior then, you know, you're going to find actually overcoming that behaviour very, very difficult. And of course, when it comes to addictive behaviour, the whole point about it is that people do lose control. And, you know, that, that, that people say, you know, how can I take responsibility for a behaviour that I've lost control over? Well, it, you know, it's, you know, when it comes to things like gambling, you do have to take responsibility for the fact that, you know, you started off, this was an active choice, whether, you know, that you wanted to play that slot machine or bet on that, that particular football match. 
you know, so it's, it's you have to work in combination with a therapist and taking responsibility. And what therapists will do, they will use various techniques. So, for instance, one of them, the most popular one is probably what called motivational interviewing, which is actually getting people into a, a state that they're ready to change. Because if you if you genuinely don't want to stop smoking or don't want to stop gambling, there is nothing a therapist is going to do that's going to change you. So, you know, what what you know, what you do is is basically elicit, you know, use techniques that elicit, you know, th this idea that you can start to self appraise your behavior in relation to yourself with other people that you can actually then start to want to change that behavior. You know, how many people when they are, you know, if you know, at New Year's, for instance, this is a classic time that people try to stop potentially addictive behaviors like smoking, you know, want to do more exercise, lose weight, stop eating bad food or what, you know, all those things together. How many, you know, smokers, you know, you know, don't throw away their light lighters. They don't get rid of all the paraphernalia. I mean, that's almost telling you that they know they might lapse and slip, slip back into it or that, you know, they, the idea that I'm never going to do this again is not really cross 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 their mind in those, those situations is there some science that you can you can give us around what's actually happening within the body well there is, there is you know can i just say i'm not a neuro yeah i'm not a neuropsychologist i'm just a plain old psychologist you know i don't collect my data by looking at people's uh, brain scans obviously we know that when it comes to things like gambling video game playing even social media use is that the way that, that the brain lights up when people are rewarded is pretty much similar to what you find with more traditional drugs, okay? So, you, you know, you'd have to go and, ha go and ask the brain people which parts of the brains light up in, in similar ways. But that is why um, gambling is now being accepted as a, a genuine behavior addiction because those people who work on, you know, the, 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 the kind of brain aspect have shown, um, you know, from a biological point of view, gambling pretty much um, does the same things as you know more traditional drugs so when it comes to drugs like dopamine when it comes to drugs like uh, adrenaline you know the things that we associate with more traditional psychoactive substance-based addictions we also find in behavioral addictions as well and that is why things like um, social media use um, will never you know will not be formally recognized you know, sorry social media addiction will not be formally formally recognized as an addiction probably for a long long time because before you can do that you need to have you know basically the biological underpinnings large-scale epidemiological uh, research using nationally represented populations that has not happened for sex addiction it's not for social media addiction or exercise addiction I mean, the only two behavior addictions that have been given any kind of credence in the medical and psychiatric world are gambling addiction and gaming addiction. And the reason is, is because, as I say, on a brain level, on an epidemiological level, there is now research to show that, you know, these these things are genuine addictions in the same way that we, we consider more traditional addictions like, you know, the, the heroin addictions, the smoking addictions, the, the alcohol addictions. What's really fascinating, Mark, is the fact that obviously through this conversation, you've talked very much about actually how few people are, will become an addict. So, you know, you have you can have problematic behaviour, enthusiastic behaviour. Um, but do you have any advice for those people that perhaps do you feel that they are displaying addictive behaviour? Well, you know, the stock answer I have to give is that, you know, I, the British Psychological Society say because I've not got a practicing certificate, I'm not actually allowed to, to give, if you like, psychological advice on what people should do. And, you know, basically, you know, whether you think you've got a, a problem with your gambling, gaming is officially what you're supposed to do is get a referral from your, your GP to a clinical psychologist. However, most people, you know, their behavior isn't something that's even approaching a genuine addiction. It's actually more to do with the fact that it's what I call an habitual behavior that's actually impinging negatively on some areas of, of your life. You know, and for most of those, I mean, particularly when you're younger, it's actually going to be the parents that really have to impose some kind of limits on what their children can and can't do. But of course, for an adult, that's a bit different. And really, you've got to think to yourself, you know, why am I engaging in this more? You know, why am I spending more time on social media rather than interacting with my kids? Why am I spending more time playing this video game than doing my job or whatever? You know, those kind of things, you really just have to, you know, get your life back into perspective. Um, you know, 
it's also realizing that the you know as i say these habitual behaviors are not um genuine addictions and so what you have to start doing you know there's a lot you know particularly when it comes to technology there are lots of tools that can now be used so for instance social media uh, so one of the things about social you know habitual social media use and i, I you know i see it with with you know my colleagues is that every few minutes you're looking at your phone seeing what messages have come in you hear that beep you hear you know a little tone that comes in you know there are tools now that for instance that uh, you know will allow you to only get your messages once an hour you know there are things that you know you can turn things off overnight so that you know you don't you know you're not waking in the middle of the night because th things are coming in you know there are there are limit setting tools i mean a lot of you know social media have now taken some of the tools that are in the gambling industry and they've you know they've, they've basically shifted them wholesale to to social media you know all i would say is that you know particularly when it comes to technology there are technology technological tools out there that can help you minimize the amount of time that you spend on on you know those apps or those those things that you're you're doing but you know i say that i have to really do have to reiterate for most people you know the, these 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 excessive behaviors they're not problematic they're not addictive but it is just about trying to keep things in balance. I mean, I know it's a cliche, everything in moderation, but that's really what life should be about. You know, and even as I say, even when people do things to excess, if you've got other people that do it with you, you know, if you're if you're a part, you know, if you're married to somebody who likes your hobby or your, you know, your particular enthusiasm as much as you are, there's no problems because you're doing it together. The problem is, is when you're into something and you know the the your children or your partner aren't into that as well and it's that's where the the, the frictions it can come to me but it really is about you know for me lots of these things whether it's exercise whether it's game playing whether it's social media use it's about you know doing the things that you have to do in life first and you you know doing those other things as a reward and a pleasure after you've done the things that you have to do whether it's work whether it's the stuff with your family is you know giving yourself those things as a treat and um, the word addict or addiction, you know, is it overused? Uh, yeah, the word addiction is, def is, is definitely an overused word in the sense that, you know, people, we can all think of, you know, there are TV shows that we call addictive viewing. This book is addictive reading. What people are actually saying, you know, that's the word addiction there being used in a kind of metaphorical sense. It's not being used in the clinical sense whatsoever. You know, as I say, I'm accused of watering down the concept of addiction by applying it to other behaviours, but I've got strict clinical criteria for how I, I define addiction. You know, parents will use the word addiction and pathologise their children's behaviour all the time because, you know, I mean, but, you know, a lot of the thing is that it's just to do with the amount of time that people spend on things. And addiction, as I've said before, has, has very little to do with, you know, time is not a good predictor of addiction because there are just loads of activities that we do that take lots of time but have no negative detrimental effects. But yes, the word addiction is definitely overused. It's definitely used in ways it shouldn't be. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't use the word because I do think that, you know, when we use the word and when, you know, when psychologists use the word, even though we've all got different definitions of what it is to be addicted, there is still a core understanding of what addiction is, is really about. And what we're talking about is a behavior basically that takes over your life that you do to the neglect of everything else, which unfortunately has long term negative detrimental consequences. But that is why when we, you know, when we take that core behavior, very few people would be genuinely classed as addicted to any type of drug or any type of behavior because th those negative effects are just not there. So, Mark, you've written 1300 papers over 35 years you know are you close to kind of coming to an end of the world of addiction not at all the great thing i mean the thing about addiction is that it's a really complex human behavior you know uh, the more that we know about it it always raises new questions there are always going to be new activities that come along that you know we can start researching you know when i started 35 years ago on slot machine addiction as much as i love it today i never would have thought that I would be writing papers on internet addiction or social media addiction. These are things that we couldn't, I couldn't even imagine three and a half decades ago. Yet, the, you know, these new behaviours have come along where I can use that the kind of findings from my work on gambling and start to apply them to things like social media, to virtual reality, to to the internet or whatever. I mean, that's what's really exciting as a psychologist is that these, you know, every time you answer one question, 
you know, another three questions come along. That's that's the nature of, of research. That doesn't mean that everything that I've done has not been useful in terms of, you know, moving the, the, the field forward. But for me, it's always about the cumulative impact. There is no one study that I think to myself, oh, that's, uh, you know, that I'm more proud of that study than anything else. For me, what I'm most proud of is the fact that, you know, I started in one area, I've applied it to, to lots of other different areas, and it's that cumulative research that basically has, a, you know, a long lasting impact on the field. Now, obviously, when I'm, you know, when I'm long gone, that hopefully people will be building on my research and taking that forward, you know, and in thousands of years time, I'll be a nothing, but I'm part of that, you know, that little part of the jigsaw that gets us to, to where we want to be. I, you know, I would, I would actually argue that you will never, ever get rid of addictive behavior. It does seem to be something fundamental about the human condition that there are always going to be, you know, a small percentage of, of people who get really hooked on things. What that, you know, what people are hooked on in 3000 years time, I have no idea whatsoever. But, you know, even in the 35 years that I've been researching addictive behavior, I never, ever could have predicted 35 years ago that I'd be looking at things that, you know, were just, you know, not even a glint in people's eye. These are completely new behaviours. But obviously, the research I've done in one area gives you a large insight to, to these new behaviours that have come along. Mark, thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing, obviously, your years and years of research into the area of addiction to our listeners. Um, it's been fascinating. I think it's given us all a lot to think about, you know, as we discussed, the word addiction is quite well overused. And actually, there's so much enthusiasm in our behaviour. And I think you mentioned the word, you know, you want people to enjoy the things they enjoy. And that's a really important part of our of our makeup as human beings. So thank you so much for, for sharing um, your time with us today. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to find out about Mark's work, you can find him on Twitter at Dr. Mark Griffiths, and you can find out more in the episode description. You've been listening to the Research Reimagine podcast by Nottingham Trent University. For all of the latest news from the research community at NTU, follow us on Twitter at NTU underscore research or sign up to our research newsletter by visiting ntu.ac.uk forward slash research. Thanks for listening.